Twist. So welcome to our our joint seminar uh, with uh, you know Center of uh, Mediterranean Studies and uh, Department of International Relations. I am Emre Shere. I'm the director of Center for Mediterranean Studies. I will be moderating the session. So today, Emel Akçalı from Kadiras University, Associate Professor at Kadiras University, is with us. Uh, I would like to briefly, uh, you know, introduce her, and uh, I will let the floor to her to give her seminar. And uh, Associate Professor Akçalı's uh, research and teaching uh, yeah, interests are environmental geopolitics, post-human international relations, critical security studies, non-Western and alternative global political uh, geopolitical discourses, and non-Western IR. She has uh, far published in various journals, including Political Geography, Security Dialogue, Antidope, Eurasian Geography and Economics, and various others. And her most recent publication uh, uh, appeared in Uluslararası İlişkiler Dergisi in English. It's co-authored uh, with uh, Evrim Görmüş and Soli Özer, uh, titled Turkey's Green uh, Imagination, the Hybrid Spatility and Low Carbon Energy Transition within the EU Green Deal. And her forthcoming publication or book, uh, again with Evrim Görmüş and Soli Özer, uh, will be published in Edinburgh University Press. Uh, going green in Turkey and environmental geopolitics in the southeastern Mediterranean. And today she will give a talk with the title "Planning a Green Energy Transition in Earthquake Prone Turkey." So thank you very much again for being with us. And the floor is yours. We are looking forward to hear yours. Okay. Seminar. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, Obviously, what I will try to do, uh, I will try to give a brief uh, framework of uh, of our previous uh, research and also the article, the publications, and what we mean, I mean, our main concerns, why we started this uh, research, why we are working on it, and also try to make, a, just draw a framework within which we try to explain this grand, green transformation in Turkey, the problems that we find with it, and also the solutions, I mean, kind of the, uh, we, there is a little bit of a problem solving touch uh, in our research as well. And we have some suggestions uh, because we think that maybe the green transformation drawing upon our previous research, uh, we think that the green transformation uh, should take a certain turn actually uh, in order to be effective. So we have some suggestions. And in the end, I will try to link all this uh, with the this uh, earthquake uh, problem in Turkey as well, because obviously we knew that our country is seismic, but this was something that we were not maybe thinking too much when we were planning these, you know, making these big plans, uh, including green energy transformation. Uh, but now I think whatever we do uh, now from now on needs to also take this point, take this uh, issue into consideration as well, hopefully. Uh, not only us academics, but also at the policy level. All right, so uh, what uh, uh, we all know, I mean, we all heard about this Anthropocene uh, epoch, uh, the geological era, uh, which signifies, I mean, this was uh, advanced by the uh, Nobel Prize winner, Paul Crutzen, the chemist and Nobel Prize winner, Paul Crutzen, and biologist, Eugene Stormer, uh, who described this era uh, within which we live as the Anthropocene era, and which signifies that the Homo sapiens have made such a significant impact on Earth and its inhabitants that this has caused a lasting and potentially irreversible effect on its systems, environments, pro processes, and biodiversity. Uh, so as the climate is changing and species are disappearing at an unprecedented rate, a developing field of Anthropocene geopolitics has, been emer has emerged. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is also this Anthropocene geopolitics is now exploring policies and understandings that aspire for a sustainable world no longer dependent on fossil fuels. And uh, most recently, terms and concepts associated especially with environmental studies such as resilience, climate, biodiversity, and ecology have also entered the discipline's vocabulary. This new imagining had to be a more than human approach to the world, 
going beyond modern conceptions of uh, humanity separated from nature. As such, together with the influence of complexity thinking, actor network theory of Bruno Latour, the French thinker Bruno Latour, and critical animal studies, which is something also developing uh, as a part of international relations, as a part of critical international relations. And finally, posthumanism, a new critical uh, IR term. Uh, this has advanced as a new concept within international relations. So this Anthropocene geopolitics challenges the discipline's human-centered focus and the belief that humans have a right to consume the planet's resources without constraints so solely for their benefit and development. Uh, however, uh, both this Anthropocene approach and post-humanist approaches are criticized for not pointing at the ways in which green energy transition are uh, interestingly bound up with political and economic structures within any given context. Uh, for instance, the Greek Cypriot uh, scholar, uh, Agantelou, Anna Agantelou, and I believe that his partner wrote a paper where they argue that, uh, for instance, that many climate change analysts focus on crisis and a call for immediate fixes through market forces. So any solution that is actually advanced for a, a to, to address the environmental problems is again waited for, expected from the market forces. And then they say that these are often guided by a combined fantasy of catastrophe and force present these macroeconomic models for a future um, which gives a priority, a clean fight in the short term rather than a livable planet. Uh, Yalda Erçandarlı, who also works on critical realism, I think she, I believe that she did her PhD with Faruk Yalvaj in the Middle East Technical University. And she further claimed that there exist significant problems with the ontological conceptions of both posthumanist and Anthropocene approaches, because they reduce environmental ecological issues to agental capacities, like agent centrism or agent orientism, disregarding the complex and socially constructed nature of environmental problems. So solutions to environmental problems, therefore, should not only focus on material dialectical relationship between nature and society, but also on the dynamics of the capitalist mode of production within the context of complex relations among states and classes, as well as different hegemonic projects of exploitation and rule. As Marxist ecological thinkers rightly argue, the environment as a socio-economic system is not external to the production of knowledge in capitalism. Rather, it is materially and ideologically internal to capitalist relations of production. Jason, Jason Moore has even called the Anthropocene age as Capitalocene in order to scrutinize the historical developments and the structures that have led to ecological crisis. So this is was a bit our framework uh, when we started uh, this project about green energy transformation and also what's going on in the world, not only, only focusing on Turkey, but all over the world. And drawing upon such criticism, and which we think that complies with regional and global trends in green energy transitions. And also we thought that this is actually the guiding principles of Turkish shift to renewable energy. Uh, we thought that mainly, this is also mainly driven by the neoliberal capitalist logic, business interests, and energy security. So more kind of hardcore approaches to geopolitics. Uh, and uh, when we digged into this, we also saw that this shift has also enabled the consolidation of authoritarian politics in Turkey. Such configurations uh, actually showed us that, uh, that rather than responding efficiently to current environmental problems, uh, they actually can create uh, further problems about both environmental degradation and the green energy transformation. Uh, in her eye-opening work, Space, Spaceship in the Desert, Gökçe Günel offers an excellent example of a green imagination and energy speciality formed through authorita authoritarian neoliberalism and the potential outcomes. Mastar City has been built, for instance, in the middle of the desert in the United Arab Emirates to be the first zero-carbon city in the world and a model for other countries. This city has sought, according to Günel, to make ecological problems manageable, in the ways in which business models and design projects will contain and resolve climate change without failing to provide increased productivity and technological complexity. Günel elaborates further that the investment in renewable energy and clean technology, which is part of this transition, 
was expected to shift the Emirates image from oil producer to technology developer, rendering the Emirate as one of uh, my interlocutor, uh, as one of her interviewees put it, more elite. Despite this ambition, though, Mustar City has received much criticism from both environmental scholars and activists because it requires at the same time massive amounts of energy, land space, and already scarce water resources and construct to construct and sustain. The $22 billion Mustar project where it was originally funded from revenues from oil and gas exports as well, raising the ethical question regarding how a city that is funded by money may through selling oil to power industries that are responsible for greenhouse gases and harmful emissions can be considered sustainable. The UAE also tops world rankings uh, on per capita, uh, capita carbon footprints. And within such a context, Mustar will arguably have only a marginal impact on redu reducing Abu Dhabi's greenhouse gas emissions. And when we, this is obviously uh, maybe not the best example, obviously, because we are also talking about a Gulf country, a frontier state economy, and also not uh, a, a democracy here. But in the same way, when we also look at the European Union, when how it is introduced and how it is going, uh, we also see some problems with it and the ways in which that it also puts green energy transformation into practice. So we all know what the EU, EU Green uh, Deal is. Uh, with all Yet with all its good intentions, uh, the Green Deal cannot escape the criticism of continuing to business as, business as usual, despite its innovative nature. Since the Green Deal requires an immense technology change program, replacing fossil fuels with energy based on clean sources, it is also viewed by a, as a way of creating new opportunities for EU companies companies and states in the global market. So it is also kind of analyzed, seen, considered within the market logics. EU, EU analysts caution, for instance, that China and other economic and geopolitical rivals can become African states' main partners in this sense if Europeans stand outside from green energy innovation ecosystems that combine telecoms, digital platforms, solar power, and the internet of things. Uh, the EU Green Deal further creates uncertainty for partner countries on how to adapt the EU's new rules, regulation and standards, and the extent of EU support for adjusting to these. The current time period in reality is expected to represent the transitions from the fossil fuel age to low carbon energy age in terms of substitution, shift between energy sources and natural gas is regarded as the transition fuel or as an interim solution. Hence, in the world now, no entity in the global scene has withdrawn yet from the global energy market and competition, creating a hybrid energy space and environmental geopolitical scene. Although the Green Deal has been introduced as a big structural change, the EU also signed at the same time a multi-billion euro pipeline ISMAN to transport natural gas from the offshore gas reserves from the Eastern Mediterranean into Greece, in conjunction with the Poseidon and gas interconnector, Greece, Bulgaria pipelines into in, in Italy and other green European regions. This is why the EU has been accused by the M25, a progressive environment, a movement for Europe, of greenwashing the existing status quo and not targeting a genuine Green New Deal for Europe. So in this wider context of speciality of low carbon transition driven by market values and top-down decision-making, uh, mechanisms that precludes a genuine community involvement, Turkey's own green imagination has thus far not evolved in a groundbreaking pattern either. Uh, so, I mean, we it kind of follows kind of the same logics. So, plus in Turkey, we have such a thing as called crony capitalism. So we also have this and we have a, such a thing as neoliberal authoritarianism. And I have written about this as well in the past how actually neoliberalism cannot, it's not something that we can think so separately from uh, authoritarianism. So this is a kind of an amalgam in Turkey uh, with all these factors and how this green energy uh, is involving. We have, we have mentioned many of these details in the final, in the last article that was published in Uluslararası İlişkiler about how this has developed in Turkey. Uh, but I would also like to mention a little bit in order to give us some uh, ideas about how these things uh, have as, uh, actually developed. 
Uh, let's say, for instance, when we start uh, with the renewable energy laws that started uh, in, in the year 2000, 2005, 2007, we can further understand how things have evolved in Turkey. So the 2005 renewable energy and 2007 energy efficiency laws further deepen the liber liberalization process in the national power generation and energy sector in Turkey. On May 18, 2005, Turkey passed its first renewable energy law, the utilization of renewable energy sources for the purpose of generating electric energy. In 2010, the renewable energy law was amended to introduce a new favorable tariffs for the sale of electricity generated by re renewable energy sources. Uh, and as a candidate country for EU membership, Turkey also published its national renewable action plan in 2014 and national efficiency action plan in 2017 and adopted the goal of achieving a 30% share for renewable energy in the electricity generation mix and a 10% for renewable energy in the transportation sector by 2023. Uh, despite obviously these abundant renewable resources, the share of renewables in total final energy consumption and the transportation sector is not that high in Turkey. Uh, so, uh, and if you come to, so as Turhan and Gündoğan rightly argue, that given the current authoritarian neoliberal moment and the state of chronic capitalism in the country, uh, it would be also useful to keep in mind that the history of carbon markets is ridden with politically motivated exceptions and exemptions. Therefore, these mechanisms also run the risk of simply being new excuses for economic redistribution to those who are already powerful. Collaborative relations between the state and powerful market forces at the expense of local livelihoods in the low carbon transition has been most noticeable in the hydroelectric energy production in Turkey. Uh, while the AKP government advocated hydroelectric power generation as a way to utilize the country's renewable sources and to reduce economic dependence on fossil-based imported energy profit-seeking businesses, even without sectoral experience found, hydroelectric power plants to be uh, an, a lucrative enterprise. In order to open all the rivers and streams of Turkey to hydropower, the legislative framework, including an environmental impact assessment by law was changed and the role of the state was institutionalized toward auditing with a new wider context of development and management of renewable energy resources. So despite the destructive impacts of hydropower plants on ecosystems, for instance, hydropower dominates renewable energy production in Turkey. And even though renewable energy generation increased by 64% from 2002 to 2010, hydropower plants accounted for 92% for total re renewable energy generation in 2010. Large-scale wind and solar power plant investments can also be assessed as spatial interventions to privatize the gains from the low carbon energy transition in Turkey. In 2018, there were 171 wind power facilities in operation, all of which were owned by major energy and construction companies, uh, Borusan and Demirar Energy. Uh, and the majority of these wind power projects were carried out in accordance with the old procedures based on legislation dated in 2003, in which there were no site selection criteria or environmental impact assessment procedure requirements. Uh, and then wind energy projects, which were easily approved without taking into consideration any detrimental effects on rural landscapes, are mostly located on the Karaburun Peninsula. Uh, not only pastures, treasury, or state lands, but also private properties were leased to five private energy companies, uh, Ayan, Chaluk, Ores, Salman, and Lodos Energy for the construction of wind power plants in Karabun. 87 wind turbines out of total 131 in Karabun Peninsula are owned by Lodos Energy, which dominates 60 per 61 percent of the peninsula alone. And by excluding communities and civil society actors and the environmental decision-making process, the renewable energy resource areas, which are called Yeka in Turkish, were introduced in 2016 to offer investors renewable energy resource zones and its electrical connection capacity utilization rights using an auction mechanism. In 2017, the first Yeka tender was organized for the construction of the largest solar plant in Karapınar district of Konya, in which Kalyon Energy and its South Korean partner, Hanwha, won the tender. Kalyon Energy also won one of the largest wind tenders in a consortium with Siemens and Türkerler in the same year. 
So uh, by employing uh, various state enforcement tools, rural livelihoods and land were put at the service of this extraction infrastructure industry in the process of a market-led low carbon transition. Hence, as Tuhan and Gündoğan also highlighted, the expansion of market logic to climate policy and the constitutive role of the state in co-producing and maintaining carbon markets does not amount to a rollback of the state, but rather to a newly defined power for state to control its subjects through the interface of economic incentives together with coercion where necessary. Uh, again, I mean, while we go you know, into details of this, we saw that the guiding principles of Turkey's low carbon en energy transition have hence been mainly driven by neoliberal logic, business interests, energy security, and regime consolidation without efficiently responding to the environmental problems that emanate from strong growth in energy demand and an associated increase in import dependency. Uh, and this is just to underline again, not so different from how things are being run in the world either. I mean, when you look at also how, uh, if you look at the green energy transformation in Greece, uh, you see that this is also not very different. And if you look at in some you know, other European countries, maybe obviously there might be, I mean, there is more the rule of law in uh, many of these cases. But there are cases, especially in Southern Europe, uh, that this is the main framework in which the green energy transformation is uh, being run. So what do we propose? Uh, how things are going to be? Uh, and last year, for instance, just to give you an example before I actually go to the part where I would like to speak about uh, what we propose and what we think, uh, I mean, to this type of you know, hybrid regime, uh, just to let you know that Turkey is not really an exception in this, uh, I uh, want to show a little bit of an extract from a movie that I watched last year at the Istanbul Film Festival. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of time to watch this year, but this was a movie um, that uh, shows how the solar panels, for instance, the green energy transformation is changing the whole landscape, especially for small farmers. Uh, in, in the Catalan region, in some part, in a in small area of the Catalan region in Spain. And this is also how it's changing the livelihood of the small farmers. Uh, this is mainly what we argue as well, and this is what we would like to do in our new research and what we would like to include in our book uh, that is forthcoming by Edinburgh University Press, is that without the local ownership and without uh, the uh, participatory or uh, you know, kind of a democratic uh, involvement, and, and without the energy justice, uh, this uh, green energy transformation is not going to be sustainable uh, in any of the places. I mean, it's just going to go with kind of the same logic of the market logic. And I think when we kind of link it with this issue of earthquake, this is also related with that because the earthquake is also has to do with any, I mean, it needs to do with the local lo local involvement and it also needs to deal with how, I mean, to ask actually the needs of the people. So it's not just a market logic that's changing the whole economy, a huge transformation, a top-down and reductionist uh, involvement or intervention in the society, but needs to include the society and their livelihoods and all that. So, I mean, we see this all kind, it's all related actually uh, with each other. So let's see a little bit this movie and then uh, we will also talk about uh, a bit of uh what we try to propose let's see it's just a just a trailer but it just shows um you know uh, gives the idea okay Yosh, oh when i make it i think big it unfortunately it doesn't uh, share let's see if I can. Lo que la carta de un molcla es la final de sí, la de visa de y punto. 
no hay amigos. Son ellos los países, no son populares de España. Uh, I mean, if you have a chance, I'll, I, I recommend you to uh, see this uh, movie, uh, which also shows that, you know, without kind of local environment, that this becomes like a new uh, economic, uh, obviously a facility, an opportunity, not only for big markets, but also for local people, but it's detrimental, for instance, for the livelihood of uh, some other uh, local people who live there. Uh, because this is a little bit done, as I said, not only in Turkey, but also in an EU country like Spain, or I mean, what we studied in Greece, uh, that uh, it's a bit of a kind of a top-down project, uh, with, in neglecting the uh, local uh, ownership of things. So this is uh, what we are concerned. This is our main concern. This is what we have found out in the previous study, and this is what we would like to carry on, and whether this can be developed in Turkey uh, with a kind of maybe establishing some cooperatives or how we can get actually people more involved and how that this whole project, you know, this market-ridden uh, project doesn't uh, steal the role from the genuine environmentalists, okay, or people who are concerned uh, by uh, really environmental degradation. Uh, so such hybrid and neoliberal energy transition policies uh, have created their own source of discontents in Turkey. Various environmentalist activists that we conducted interviews with in Turkey are concerned but that while the percentage of renewable energy and total consumption is increasing, this does not mean that the use of ex and exploration of fossil fuels is decreasing. Instead, these two sources are in a sense competing. Such, such hybridity in the low carbon energy transition in Turkey the Eastern Mediterranean and within the EU consequently narrows the discursive space of environmentalists, both within and beyond the Mediterranean, for genuine political actions to respond to actual environmental degradation in the region. Environmentalists have also pointed out that the EU Green Deal's aim of decoupling economic growth and environmental impacts can only be made possible by outsourcing polluting activities beyond EU borders. Renewables, moreover, can create further dependencies on scarce raw materials such as lithium, cobalt, nickel, and other rare earth metals, mainly important from the global south. Escribano and Lazaro warned that the increasing attention devoted to the geopolitics of renewables, including patents, flows, and strategic minerals, show, shows that path dependence on the fossil geopolitical landscape can easily turn into the fossilization of renewables. Further criticism revolves around the benefits in store for large companies and politically connected businesses. Environmental activists in Turkey and on the Greek islands of Syros and Tinos, for instance, believe that wind farm investment opportunities are mostly directed by the government to a select number of favored companies. These in turn tend to get easy access to public and protected land to install wind turbines without a genuine engagement with the needs of the livelihoods of the local population. In order to prepare societies for individuals for such a consequential political project as the EU Green Deal, Turkey, as well as other EU member states, should empower their citizens within the EU and beyond through popular assemblies and by engaging with local governments to ensure a more democratic energy transition process. Supporting communities most affected by the climate emergency by developing more sustainable commuting or encouraging the production and the sale of food locally are some examples of needed actions. Strengthening local economies, establishing platforms for sustainable consumption, providing services to people affected by climate change and environmental degradation, developing lo local solutions for sustainable energy access, reclaiming green spaces and implementing healthy waste treatment facilities while protecting worker rights are equally fundamental to such processes. 
so this is mainly, you know, what uh, we also in the new TPTAC project that we are launching, we would like to uh, assess and also some do some research, especially in the Yeka areas, in the biggest Yeka, Yeka, Yeka areas, regions, zones in Turkey, and try to see, I mean, what time of how people can get actually get more involved with this process or how you, you can increase their participation and hence to add to the sustainability. Uh, just to conclude, I just wanted to say a few more line, a few lines about the, this earthquake dimension as well. Uh, this is uh, something quite recent. Obviously, it, we didn't include it before in our project, unfortunately, because even though, as I said, we are a seismic country, for some reason, all of us, maybe all researchers have always you know, neglected this, and I wonder why. But uh, lately I have checked out uh, what happened to, for instance, these uh, solar or wind turbine uh, zones, uh, uh, pa panels in the earthquake region, because there were, uh, in the, there were in the earthquake region as well. Uh, so apparently, I mean, this is also obviously the official information, but apparently uh, that um, uh, even though there are significant renewable energy investments, especially wind power plants in the earthquake region, uh, nothing happened uh, to them. Uh, this disaster didn't really touch, and that apparently it is a great success that renewable energy-based production didn't stop and continues to produce uh, to be produced in provinces affected by earthquakes uh, that took place in a period of intense uh, consumption. Uh, and uh, so this is also kind of saying, actually, this was a proof that uh, the renewable energy uh, production should actually much be, uh, that the share should rise and, and it should be increased almost to 75%. And again, when we check the numbers that are given by the Anadolu Agency, uh, that uh, there were a total of 21 wind power plants were uh, up and running following the earthquake. Uh, in the earthquake region, and uh, that kind of all these, you know, the power plants that spread across seven uh, cities in the earthquake region are actually have been some supplying an uninterrupted power to earthquake affected areas. Uh, for instance, according to TREP data, Hatay is the earthquake affected region with the most wind plants, 11 in total, uh, and the earthquake epicenter Kahraman Marash has two power plants. Uh, but wind, wind, wind forms with installed capacities uh, have been operating in the provinces of Adana, Gaziantep, Malatya, and Adiyaman, respectively. And power generation has resumed in the Osmania Gaziantep region. Uh, so, uh, according to this kind of data that I could collect, uh, it seems like a success story. Uh, but I think that this should be monitored, further monitored in all regions, and also from now on, uh, this should be the priority given uh, when, when these new yekas are being uh, installed, are being uh, constructed, uh, and then this should, be, this should be the number one priority given the importance of things. And finally, I would like to conclude by emphasizing again that the EU Mediterranean uh, Green uh, Energy Cooperation and the EU environmental policy towards the Mediterranean uh, needs to evolve into a more participatory direction rather than a reductionist one. Uh, as I said, we are now working on a fieldwork consisting of a participant observation and open-ended interviews in Karapunar, Melikzad, Gazi solar panel, Yekas, and Soma and Karaburun, uh, wind uh, power Yekas. And uh, we also try to work on some scenario planning methods of how we can actually, uh, things can be improved in these regions. So the experiences and thoughts uh, of the local people, uh, the civil society, environmentalists nearby these zones uh, will be analyzed. And we hope to analyze in depth how the green energy transformation process can become more participatory and sustainable in Turkey and how corporations can serve regional peace and uh, that uh, can serve the regional peace and how this can actually further develop in the Southeast Mediterranean uh, in the context of green energy transformation. Uh, not to uh, continue this more um, uh, mainstream or traditional geopolitical competition, but to uh, maybe uh, evolve into what we call environmental geopolitics, a geopolitical approach, which is based more on cooperation 
uh, through working together on the environmental problems in the region, which affect all the countries, uh, because, you know, as we know, the environmental problems do not recognize borders. Uh, so in a sense, uh, we hope that this research can also um, help to develop this concept of uh, borderless environmental geopolitics. Okay, I think I will stop here and the rest uh, we can continue with just questions and then maybe uh, just a kind of a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emel Hocam, uh, bringing our attention to various concepts. I mean, this uh, environmental geopolitical outlook uh, ecosystem is supposed to be the focal point. And uh, you also, uh, I think that point about your reservations on this Green Deal, and also uh, even though Turkey has this renewable energy, you know, investments going on, but also you remind us that uh, the way that they should design should be inclusive so that uh, local actors are supposed to be taken into uh, account while we've been designing them. So these are all important points that we forget, you know, mm -hmm. uh, also the when we, you know, the, the discord in the air is that as long as we've been, you know, generating renewable energies, uh, electric from renewable energies, it could be beneficial for the society. Uh, but you are reminding us that beyond that, we also need to pay close attention to uh, to what extent local actors has been involved in the uh, process. Also, also th that's also quite important uh, points while we've been thinking about how we will be designed those earthquake prone regions. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, you also mentioned that still renewable energy generation going on, but of course the way that they have been designed for uh, new ones, we need to think about how they will be designed. Let's say sometimes we've been discussing with our friends as well. If you are building those solar mm -hmm. panels on, let's say, agricultural zones, then we need to think twice. It's not just about generating electricity from renewable solar, but we also need to have a more comprehensive outlook by taking account various stakeholders uh, in the process of green transition. And the, the term, I, I wasn't thinking that deep in that, the difference between low uh, carbon transition and green transition. But after your uh, presentation, I think we need to uh, utilize more green transition mm -hmm. rather than low uh, carbon transition. Uh, you know, maybe you you also be following. I mean, uh, I uh, saw that Germany phase out from nuclear. That's great. But then onwards, I realized that they are continuing to rely on coal. Uh, so on the one hand, you've been thinking about, you know, uh, Germany is the pioneering actor behind that green transition. But on the other hand, the supposition that I had is they phase out from coal as well, but that's not the issue at all. So uh, all in all, what we need to do, I mean, thank you for, uh, I think, bringing us attention to those concepts and how we need to think about that transition, green transition. So uh, I have some uh, further questions by participants. I see Daphne Günay, uh, she's our chair and she's also uh, working on climate change issues. And also I know that she has a study on uh, EU and uh, Egypt and through neo-governmental perspective. Maybe she would like to jump in also uh, Ayşe Gül Kibarolo and variety of others. And Tuğçe Hoca, uh, also, we have brought a piece together on Turkey's uh, uh, energy governance, uh, and we've been looking through a critical perspective on this Turkey's neoliberal model that we wrote together. So, are there any questions that you would like to uh, post or comment? I will just turn on the lights, okay? Just while you're. Okay. Yes. Ne hocam? buyurun. Hocam çok teşekkür Emel hocam. Thank you very much for the great presentation. 
Uh, and I would like to thank again on behalf of the Department of International Relations as well for being with us today. Uh, Emre Hocam, thank you for your introductions. Uh, I was wondering, Hocam, uh, what is the... Uh, you mentioned how capitalism works this way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wondered if capitalism, the, a systemic change of capitalism is the only way to achieve climate and energy justice. Mm -hmm. uh, or is there a more reformist way of achieving this? Is there a more reformist way of uh, popularizing rooftop solar panels? Uh, can legal reforms be... Uh, uh, can they alleviate this problem? Uh, that's my question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, shall I go just by answering uh, just each question? Yes, sure. I don't see another question. At, at okay. so, uh, well, that would be kind of the ideal answer, but I think that it's not realistic, obviously, to change the whole system. And, you know, I mean, it's, it needs to be not just even a local revolution, it needs to be a global revolution in order to change this whole system. So I guess at the moment uh, we can criticize and we can try to reform some of the things. And how can we do such things? For instance, uh, I guess uh, one way in which, um, you know, maybe not to change the whole capitalistic system right away, because I don't think that it's going to be so realistic, but such a thing that kind of a post-neoliberal, post-neoliberalism, and in the sense to create more participatory democracy through popular assemblies and popular assemblies, meaning that the local population as well take uh, place, I mean, are included in the decision making mechanisms when we are changing all these landscapes, for instance, and we are building these yekas and who are these, for instance, the Korean, you know, it just doesn't become just for the benefit of certain companies, for instance, and we also don't know how these uh, the agreements are taking place behind, all right? I mean, and what's going to happen and how long sustainability. So maybe uh, I'm just thinking that uh, we can start uh, with this way. Uh, the other thing uh, as well, uh, like to be able to uh, teach also the local population the ways in which that there can be a more sustainable, a kind of a degrowth, for instance, a life and, and also to... To why not also to use more of the sea power, like sea power instead of, again, using uh, cars or maybe build more trains and uh, also build more cooperatives and uh, and try. I mean, this is what I see as well when I go to the countryside in Turkey, that um, even the, the, the villagers or the farmers, I don't think they know so much about all these environmental problems or what, for instance, the extreme use of plastic does or extreme uh, or uh, how they can actually make use of this, again, the renewable energies or green energy um, in, in the future. So it seems like these projects are being done uh, without involving you know, the, the local population. I don't know, maybe your experiences are different or in some places, maybe this is different, but what I see, you know, generally uh, thus far, I see that this is the biggest problem. And maybe we can try to narrow that gap. Uh, yes, you know, we criticize capitalism, you know, in what we write in the academia, but on the, I think uh, in the, on the field, this is how we can initiate and how we can start off and let's see how things are going to follow because, um, to, to do a kind of a revolutionary change in the market economies, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Vijayana. So thank you for your answers. Uh, if there's no other question here, uh, uh, it seems to me that, that it boils down to democratization. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond all of that, so that because it is we need a kind of sort of political economic outlook rather than just solely about be, you know blaming capitalism per se. We need to think about the, the ways through which we can mm -hmm. invite more inclusion about the mm -hmm. stakeholders at the end of today so that ask myself about what about eu case so in the case of eu you know when we look from from turkey we see that consolidated democracy over there mm -hmm. but 
uh, it is a type of a model in that, that it, as the way that you put it because you have the skeptical outlook towards uh, that green deal but it is uh, too much uh, involved in this neoliberal governmentality along mm -hmm. with the democracy at the same time same time so my friend about that as well uh, my student about that again here again you see the dominance of uh, big capital uh, while formulating policies so when it comes to the real change uh, uh, on the way to green transition we see that kind of uh, obstacles on the way to harness that green transition but of course then uh, it becomes quite uh, Uh, difficult for us to express the driving factor of Turkey's energy. Uh, we've been studying it uh, to charge our uh, energy transition, Turkey's green transition. But at this point, uh, what could be the tools that at least uh, EU has in hands in order to harness Turkey's green transition? Despite all this limitation that it has, still it has some tools, of course, I mean, to uh, push to uh, harnesses what ways you think they could be uh, enhanced of course it is it takes two to tango as well it's not just uh, eu is pushing turkey green transition but of course there's also turkey side what could you say about uh i mean what could in what ways eu could contribute to turkey because it's also related with as i mentioned as far as i said democratization in turkey as well that's quite a tricky issue as well, political issue, that's why. So I think uh, I think the EU could you elaborate on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I couldn't hear everything because there was a problem with the internet connection, but uh, I think I got the point in general. Uh, I think that there's an issue with uh, this type of problems also within the European Union. I was checking uh, the latest kind of these horizon projects and how the EU wants research and things like that. And I think they also want to increase this local involvement and understand how people can get more involved. But I think like as all EU projects, this has started like a more top-down project, the Green Deal. Uh, and uh, yes, some people are more uh, maybe informed, there can be some regional differences, some regions, but we know that all within the EU as well, there are regional differences, right? And even within the countries, I mean, there are regional differences. So uh, uh, I think they have an issue with that as well, that this is a kind of a local ownership of this green energy transformation, and I would like to increase that as well. So first of all, this is like, like a general problem, I think, in general. I think China, for instance, is uh, pushing it like through the, the state involvement. I mean, giving incentives to people to use electric cars, or for instance, or a kind of a making a conditional obligation for people. So China is also going through a kind of another dimension. So there are these type of uh, different types of attempts uh, to engage the population uh, to, to more in, into this project, because otherwise it's not going to be, um, you know, there will be some problem with the sustainability. So while they're having these problems, I mean, how they can, uh, what they can also teach Turkey, I think within the EU, Turkish relations will take a different stance. I mean, uh, just following the election. So there is also this election process. And after the elections, uh, if certain things change in the country, I think there will be closer communication relations and maybe, you know, the re reopening of the uh, negotiations as well with the European Union on many levels. So I think that's going to boost. I mean, that's going to give uh, uh, uh, vitalize also the green energy transformation in Turkey, hopefully in a more democratic, hopefully in the ways in which that we hope that, you know, that's going to be more democratic, more transparent, more participatory, uh, and also, also to increase, I mean, what the EU is trying to do in its own regions, maybe this is also going to be transferred as well in Turkey. Uh, if it, that doesn't, that scenario doesn't happen, if things do not change uh, in Turkey. I mean, if the things just go as uh, how things are now, you know, with the election results, uh, I think this is how uh, there, there will be more difficulties uh, to this end. I think that this is going to be like how we see like in the other act, uh, uh, in, in the other 
sectors and maybe there will be a lot of development and maybe there will be more production who knows i mean in the energy renewable energy sector there will be more yekas i mean turkey will be maybe the, again the europe's biggest solar panel uh, zones or uh, wind turbine zones i don't know who but uh, uh, all these issues that we mentioned now uh, may increase uh, or I mean, uh, if, if, for instance, certain actions are not taken in the ways that we spotted. So I think it all depends on uh, let's first we need to see uh, first how the election results, how that will be. And then uh, we are also we need to see also see how these type of things develop in the world, also in Europe itself. But Europe is making steps. I think that they also recognize that there is a problem here. There is a gap and they need to engage people more and they need to make it more uh, kind of a more bottom up. You know, it needs to come from more bottom up and more involvement. Uh, so hopefully, I, I don't know, I mean, there will be kind of a time process, but uh, uh, maybe things will, will happen uh, faster than uh, we think. That's it. That's my answer. In fact, there is no other comment on question. Okay. Um, so maybe we, we, we close the session. Thank you very much for being with us. So hoping that uh, after election, maybe one year later on, maybe we have had yeah. uh, enough data in our hands. Okay. Uh, about the uh, uh, earthquake region. And also we see how the election goes and we will, uh, with your data, maybe your publication will be out at that time. Then we will, in, uh, we will have you again. So I think I see a, a hand over there. I think it's Khan. So the uh, closing uh, question then, we will All be right, done. Okay, uh -huh. John? Yes. Uh, actually, I was clapping ah, my hands because uh, okay. Hojam already answered my question because I was oh, actually okay. about asking the uh, effects of the European Union and the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, what she foresee about the elections. I was about to ask that, but maybe I can ask another question, but it is not in the context of your uh, speaking right now. Maybe I can ask, uh, we were actually, we are working on a similar project right now. Mm -hmm. Shortly, we want to investigate the effects of the climate change on agriculture mm -hmm. and how it affects the farmers mm -hmm. with the Emre Hoca. Uh, in this context, uh, the solar farming is increasing day by day. And as we see, uh, the government uses the agriculture lands for the solar farming. Yeah. So the, as I know, the Konya has been the region that produces the most solar energy in Turkey. And uh, and I read the, another report in the agricultural production in the Konya has decreased. Oh. Uh, they only kind of growing uh, corpse right now. And so, I mean, there's an inverse right ratio in here. Uh, how do you think the renewable energy affects agriculture? Is it possible to talk about the negative effects of the renewable energy in Turkey uh, because of the government or the other effects, maybe? So, for example, is it possible to see agriculture under the solar panels in the future? What do you think about that? Thank you. Yes, I think this is a, so we should communicate, we should keep in touch, uh, because I think, yes, these are similar concerns uh, that we have. And then you are doing more, actually, I mean, arts is more states, more in the participation, but you are actually doing something which is more vital because there is also, it's also related with food security, right? And then there is another issue in Turkey. I have a student and we have, we, we found it out on Facebook, uh, share social media shares that the Turkish um, agricultural lands are being sold to foreigners, right? I mean, you're also seeing that. So I encourage a student of mine to do some work on it because this also started in, for instance, Africa, right? I mean, uh, European countries are buying the African uh, soil for agricultural soil. Uh, and this is, this is what's happening as well in Turkey. I mean, there are agricultural lands that are being sold to foreigners. Uh, and this is, as far as I know, mostly from not to from people to Gulf countries, for instance. Uh, so there is that, and also there is this thing about, as you say, the renewable energy panels that are uh, being um, uh, constructed on the agricultural lands. Like, but as I said, Turkey is not an exception here. 
because this movie uh, that uh, I just uh, mm -hmm. yeah. showed is about Spain. I mean, this is also, and I'm, I'm sure that it's also happening in some other places in the world as well. Uh, but uh, the thing is, obviously, Spain still is in the European Union. It's a democratic country. So when you actually make a movie like that, uh, I'm sure that it's going to uh, have find a response. You know, in the there is going to be a policy implication of this, or there is going to be a ways in which how uh, I mean they will find out how uh, they will respond to this problem. I'm not sure if this is going to be the same in Turkey. That's our difference. I mean, this is the same logic. But uh, here, uh, the responses can be different. Uh, so in a sense that we need that kind of a democratic, I mean, the transparency and democratic participation in the country as well, because as you say, there is a, there, uh, there, there is a issues here that are high at stake, as I said, mostly about food security uh, in Turkey. And there is also, we need to remember as well that there is a drought in Turkey, I mean, in the southeast of country and also starting in Syria, northern Syria, and also in the southeast of Turkey, we have a lot of problems with water shortage and also drought. And because of that, actually, I mean, most apparently the Syrians who come to Turkey in the last years are not really coming for to escape from the war, but because they are economic refugees, economic migrants, that they cannot, I mean, because of the drought in that region, they move to this part uh, to, to find, or to the cities, to the bigger cities to find work. So I think these issues are very interesting. We, I mean, this is all this food security, agricultural sector is another dimension, but as well, if we are actually using the agricultural lands to for the renewable energy zones, to build renewable energy zones, this adds another dimension to the problem that we need to research and talk about. So, Oh, that's uh, that, that's a real <laughs> thank, thank you, uh -huh. thank you very much again, for being with us. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'm looking forward to see you next year when you are you are. So it will be like a book launch, and also you will have your assessment about uh, earthquake zones and post-election periods. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Çok bye. Çok teşekkür ederim. Sağ olun. Teşekkürler hocam. Rica ederim. Hoşçakalın.